Primogen. Good morning. The green prime, green Primogen. Nice background. Thank you. You see, I I don't have a professional setup, so I do this from my living room. Uh, you know that my baby actually painted that painting over there. Your baby? I mean, well, he was. Uh, he's no longer a baby. He's fine now, but he used to be eighteen months. Uh, and then we moved to this new home. Uh, my wife got an interior designer to design the living room. And then she said, we should put some abstract art in there. My wife feeling, uh, she quoted me a painting that was like $1,000. And then my wife felt all smart and said, you know what? I can get this from Wayfair for $400. Uh, so we're going to save 600 bucks. And, you know, it's abstract art. I mean, just something that looks like it. And then I said, look, you have an 18-month-old baby. If you want abstract art, you give him paint and you let him run over the canvas. And that's exactly what he did. And that's the result. So just uh, for the folks in the audience. Then. I don't know. Other than the fact <laughs> that there's a, that it does look like a little ill planned when it comes to the edging. Yeah. Besides for that, I would say I had no idea. You could have been like, that's yeah. abstract art for a thousand dollars. And I would have bought it. I would have purchased uh. that abstract art. <laughs> Well, it cost me five dollars, I think, because it was the canvas and then black black ink and uh, the yellow one. And there you go. The framing was the expensive part. Oh, always. Yeah. In, in fact, the framing was almost four hundred dollars. <laughs> so, but at, the, at, at that point, it became sentimental, right? We said, "Look, I just uh, the, he did it, um, and we want to incentivize." Speaking of uh, being proud of your accomplishments, before we start in, going to the actual subject. You now run a coffee company. So if you want to spend a couple of minutes to do like your shameless plug, I am drinking coffee right now. It is not a terminal.shop because you guys did not ship to Canada when I was about we to buy. We do now. You do now. So I will buy I will buy it back. So tell us more about that, man. Yeah, I'd be glad to tell you more about that. As you can see right here, if I hold on one second. Let me put you, you let me just give you a, let me just give you a nice view here. So if you look right here, are we pretty close yeah. to getting it? I think we're pretty close to getting it. Oh, you have me on full screen view, huh? All right, nice. Yeah. We do a little, little SSH. Uh, that's S, a little SSH terminal, uh, terminal dot shop. You get this beautiful shopping experience where you get to buy your coffee, all that stuff. We got a, a light roast, medium, dark, and of course decaf. Quite fantastic. Ships, I think, mostly everywhere. Q to quit, of course. All SSH, and I had a neighbor. Wait, wait, hold, where are we? I'm right here. There we go. I had a neighbor that asked me if they could have my coffee. And I said, can you use SSH? They said, what's there SSH? And I said, and you can't? No. Well, somebody on Twitter was saying that you probably did this so that non-developers non will not be able to order coffee because they don't know what SSH is. But the That's reality the is that a lot... A lot of developers also don't know what SSH is, right? Yeah, but you know, we, we, we were, we're trimming the herd, all right? Only a few people get to order the coffee. No, I mean, the goal was is that this is this is purely designed for the nerd, and that's it. There's, there is absolutely no other inspiration for it other than that. Man, and you're, you're probably a nerd, but uh, and me too, and, and you're a streamer. Uh, you are... Uh, on Twitter the whole time, well, not not the whole time, but a fair amount, uh, and now have a CEO of a coffee company. But today in this podcast, I mean, this and this is of course the what inspired me to to do this. We want to talk to the man behind all of this. The only thing I know about you as a person is that you were born in Montana. So take us there from being born in Montana to where where you are today. Just the whole thing. Just start and keep well, going. Well, you know, just uh, well. You don't need to tell us about prom and stuff like that. Like, focus on on what matters. <laughs> uh, well, I can I can tell you a fun fact. Uh, when Let's my mom and my dad were younger, in their younger years of before kids and all that, my dad in North Dakota, where my mom grew up, mm -hmm. was out there being a landman, an oil man, and uh, he went to get into the car one day, and his car was inside the garage, and these were the older cars in which you plugged in. Uh, yep. And he had it plugged in and everything. And as he got in, reached in, grabbed, pulled himself up, the steering, the steering wheel snapped due to how cold it was and just broke the steering wheel while being plugged in in a garage. So he walked in to the kitchen where my lovely mother was, steering part of steering wheel in hand and said, I am leaving. You can come with me if you would like to. And that's how I made it to Montana. <laughs> 
Wait, so then I was obviously <laughs> born. Yeah. And then obviously yeah. I was born in Montana, Billings, Montana. Okay. Uh, I think I lived on a street called Princeton, if I was, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Uh, would, life's irony is that I would never be allowed at such a high flutin society. And so therefore I was born in it, uh, but never mm -hmm. allowed in it. Uh, I don't know how that works out, but that was fantastic. Very, very happy about that. And so then for the next, you know, I spent uh, up till 18 in Billings, started going to Bozeman pretty frequently uh, when I was 14 mm -hmm. and then moved to Bozeman when I was 18 and then stayed there until I was 27. So that's like kind of yeah. like the general archetype of life living in all of that. In that story, you don't give us the feeling that you came from money. No, I, I was dirt poor. Yeah. We are so poor yeah. that uh, I may or may not have received a Christmas present that was already a toy I owned. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember what that was? A Tyrannosaurus Rex. Oh, that's cool. That's may cool. or may not have been a Tyrannosaurus yeah. Rex. <laughs> or a gen generic dinosaur, right? Generic dinosaur <laughs> that's like, it could have been an Allosaurus. If we're real here, it might have been more yeah, Allosaurus-y yeah. shape, but I wouldn't have known back then. That's awesome. And were you were you doing software back then already, or is this something that came later? Um, I did. My dad did have a computer. He actually started mm -hmm. a computer company, and his whole thing was actually selling, uh, being able to do long distance phone calls and being able to buy in bulk and have that for much cheaper. Which there's a huge kind of like serendipity to that whole thing uh, that he started that company. It was too early because remember, like ten, ten, two, twenty. Or the other one, like, da mm -hmm. dialed down the middle, and you could actually buy long distance in bulk for cheaper, but that came, like, eight years later. I, I don't really, because, like, I was not born in North America, so the systems were completely different. So okay, I so I, I don't I, know what kinda, happened. I kind of relate. I kind of relate, because everywhere, I guess, got, you know, similar things, yeah. but I wouldn't know the number. Pain in the ass there. calling. Everyone got ripped off calling yeah. during well, – you still get ripped off calling uh, if you're in the right mm -hmm. area, right? If you travel and you try to call, then they try to rip you off still. Uh, yeah. But the somehow – you calling outside of the United States is vastly more expensive than inside the United States. I kind of call BS on that one. It just kind of sounds like you've made up a problem and then they're charging people. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, that happened all the time for long distance calls. And at one point, it probably was harder to do that technology. But my dad's idea was to do that. And so when he was young, um, I was probably five years old at this point, six years old, right in that area. He actually had a Windows 3.1 machine that when you booted it, it would actually go to Win like DOS. And then you type in win and it would launch windows and I could play Mejong tiles or free ski. Uh, I installed the doom via five floppy disks, bought thy flesh consumed edition. Mm -hmm. that, those were the days, man. Those were the days. Those were good days. They were very, very good, good days. days. And I enjoyed it. I really had a great time doing all of that. I could not quite understand what I was doing, but Hey, I could put floppy disks mm -hmm. in. I could figure things out. I could play Mario teaches typing. Uh, my sister who, um, graduated college before me, tied her shoes before me, and learned how to type before me, was a year and four months younger than me. She was the inspiration for the reason why I'm fast at typing. Awesome. Now, I was a bit older than that when I got my first computer. I think it was 10 or 11, but I played a bunch of games as well. Some of them I'm proud of. Some of them, are, you know, some of them are not. But uh, not stuff that I would like to see my kid playing, but uh, there I wasn't. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so then I played a game called Grail, G-R-A-A-L. I'm not sure if it's Grawl or Grail. Right. Uh, I think the guy even who created it, I think his name might be Lord Tox on uh, Twitch. I know there is some, whoever created it, created it and plays and, and streams on Twitch. And he's the reason mm -hmm. why I ever started trying to program anything ever because he had this little, uh, he had a level editor and it was like Zelda. And I loved making like levels. I used to play Warcraft 2 and make a bunch of levels. And do a lot of that. So then we could like battle each other or have AI and all that kind of stuff. And when I saw that, I started doing that. I started playing with the Grail offline editor. Mm -hmm. And when you double click on an NPC, it would actually show some code. And I was just like, what the heck is this stuff? And so I just started figuring out what it meant and was able to like create some decently complex in-game actions uh, without actually knowing what programming is, let alone what anything meant. But I, you know, I figured out what a while loop does, conditions, all that yeah. kind of stuff. I mean, it's not hard. I I, I was in fifth grade no, when it that is. happened. It, it basic. The, the first thing is. I've done, yeah, the first thing was I done was simpler than that. Despite the fact that I was actually older, I figured in some games you could go and edit the files and change the text that uh, some characters oh, yeah. would say, right? Because things are simpler, and it was just a text file, and you would go and uh, they would say one thing instead of the other. Just to... yep, classic. I did the same thing. Yeah. But there's an online game called Slayer SlayerOnline.net. I think was the name of it. It's like a leveling RPG. Mm -hmm 
real time RPG game. And if you renamed the maps and traded them out, even though online you would appear in the correct map on your screen, you'd be in a different map and you could actually mm-hmm. walk onto the water. And people were just like, how are you doing that? <laughs> it's because everything was done yeah. locally yeah. as opposed yeah. to on the server. So it's like, it's that simple as it was, it was good days back then. Yeah, so totally. Uh, and look, you are 18 at this point when you were raised by your family, uh, mom and dad, uh, were they a religious family as well? Or just uh, something that wasn't present in your life? I'd say there was a there was a, there was a little bit of it uh, before my dad died. Uh, my dad died when I was seven. Um, before that, we would go to church. I have some various memories of it uh, that that exists. And then my dad died, and then just never went back to church. Mm-hmm. So that's about that's about like my experience growing up. Yeah. But was it was it a logistical thing in in, in the sense that well, logistical my daddy thing? Is, yeah, or not like we don't believe this anymore because. Uh... No, my mom just like was she was working about uh, somewhere between yeah. 10 to 12 hours of the day. She was out of the house doing stuff and then she'd come back and do laundry and make us dinner and all that kind of stuff. So it was just more of a that's brutal. It was just impossible. In fact, she always claimed that uh, that she got her uh, God gave her her first vacation when six years into that, she fell down the stairs and broke her back. Well, talk about silver lining. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> really there was only silver lining in that one because that was crazy and so for actually funny story i used to watch um but actually really funny story i haven't shown anybody this one but i did get to i got to meet uh adam savage a couple weeks mm-hmm. ago and when after my mom broke her back i used to give her back rubs uh just because she'd be in a lot of pain and we'd watch tv and i'd get to choose what to watch if you know if i was the back rubber i would get the choice to choose what to watch and we'd watch Mythbusters. and so adam savage unironically played a large role in my childhood busting myths and i was just trying to fix my mom's back awesome uh look man one one of the things that it, in fact let me tell you this i appreciate i appreciate so much how open uh you are uh with, with some of the issues you've had in the past uh it is an inspiration for me specifically uh because i'm not uh, in fact, I think if it wasn't like a, it's not an exaggeration to say that if it wasn't for how open you are, probably I wouldn't be doing this podcast because a lot of things in my life, I want to keep it very private. Uh, and and like you are, uh, you know, some things I think we they're always the things that we keep private. But I think you were an inspiration to me, like just how open uh, you are with some things. And one of the things you were very open about is is the issue that you had with methamphetamine. So when when did that start and why? Oh, that why started right after you get it? Yeah. high school. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, when I was in high school, uh, you know, I, I was fairly ruthlessly bullied and all of that. Is and, that right? Uh, yeah, I had a lot of uh, I had a lot of emotional issues uh, when I was a, when I was a younger fella. Um, but I always was, you know, I just tend to be I don't know. I was kind of a weird guy. Maybe, you know, could call it I was somewhere on the spectrum, whatever it was. It didn't really matter. I just couldn't figure things out. And w- at the end of high school, I tried to commit suicide. And then when I kind of realized all the wrong things and in the hospital and all that kind of stuff, I kind of made this agreement with myself. I'm just not going to care again. And so from there on out, I just didn't care. And so that's, you know, that's when I started smoking and then doing mushrooms and LSD and methamphetamines and really crack, you know, smoked a little free base cocaine and all that kind of stuff, whatever I could to do something. Mm -hmm. And like, that was, that was my goal was just to do anything. And so that started when I was 18. Obviously, before I was 18, I tried to get away with a little bit of drinking. I didn't really smoke much for pot. It always made me, I always make this joke that it makes me feel like my wiener's hanging out. Like whenever I get high, I feel Mm -hmm. like so self-conscious. Like things, I just feel so, I can't like think clearly. So I'm always just like, dang, is my wiener out? I feel so, you know, I feel like I can't hold a conversation. And so it's just like, that's not something I wanted to do. I just, I just, man, I did never... not, I did not know, I did not know that you were bullied like that. And for the record, I mean, I'm trying to use the opportunity to sprinkle a little bit of my story as well whenever I can. But I meet you. Uh, I had my first friend. I still, I'm still in touch with him uh, to these days. But my first friend, I made at age 13. So for my 13 first years of my life, I had no friends, uh, and in fact, I had the opposite of friends because uh, loneliness in itself is already a problem. Yeah, like people just but uh, for me and and I guess for you, the similar thing, it was even worse because it's not only like you're you don't have people that 
want you around. They actually kind of want you around so you can be like the butt of the joke or the comic yeah. relief or whatever, or in, in, in some sense, it's even physical. And But I understand you. Like, I, I, I got a pretty fucked up, you know, just youth in, in that sense. But thankfully, I never did drugs. Uh, alcohol a bunch and, and stuff like that. But I, don't, I, I, I wouldn't even be able to articulate why. But I had yeah. a phase in, in like that as well. I would just say, you know what? Fuck this shit and part of my French and I'll just go do wild stuff. And uh, sometimes I look back and think, look, I, I think my life could have been different and if I was in, in a different path, but I wasn't. But I again, I did not do drugs, which I miracle because uh, I could see myself doing it the same way as, as, as you did. Uh, 18, man, that's early. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, dumb decisions. You know, when you, when you don't have, um, you know, when you're young, you're not, you're not, you're not necessarily the best at making great long-term decisions. Yeah. So just wasn't good at it. That's okay. Must, uh, it must have had consequences. Eh? Cause that's yeah. the problem with bad decisions. It's just, a... that's hence the reason why I did all those other things. But by, by the way, every now and then there will be a moth that's flying by. The moth, and I can see it in the camera fly through here. So if someone sees uh, it, it yeah. fly by, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a moth. I don't have a choice over what's happening right now. I don't know what's going on, but whatever, right? Make it a make it a feature, not a bug. There you go. Just uh, it's literally a bug. Yeah. <laughs> Unironically. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. Yeah, that's that's my that's like the general archetype. See, there it goes again. There's my the general archetype. I know. I don't. I, I can't. So, I thought it was. So I thought it was recursor. I thought it was recursor. You're just like, no, uh, no, it's big it's and it's fast, and I don't know where it's at right now. We'll, we'll, we'll live with the moth, man. I think. Uh, okay. Live and, with the moth. And again, you, you were at the time, it's safe to say that you were religious, but as a not much. Is that a safe assumption? or? Yeah, I would, I would probably say it's a little bit more appropriate to say I wasn't at all. I, don't, but I think to say I was you... would be, would be a, a, a bit of a, uh, a bit of a stretch. Would you would you have called yourself an atheist back then, or just a don't care kind of person? Like don't care. Agnostic. Don't care. Don't not care. not not yeah. agnostic. Just don't care. Nihilist just maybe a, would be a better yeah. nihilist. Yeah. Uh, accidental paganist maybe would be probably a better unintentional <laughs> what paganism. Paganism? What? Why? Why is that? Just to... uh, just because I just I, I mean the only part of life was to pursue and have pleasure, and I had no mm -hmm. real connection other than like light connections to things, and you know community mm -hmm. obviously was very important. Having friends, I wanted friends and all that. But I had no, I had nothing else other than the celebration of man. Yeah. Where did you make your first friends? Because uh, again, if you if you come from from a bullying background, if you were anything like me, the first thing you need to do is leave that environment and go seek a different environment, right? Where where you can, you can start fresh. Because once you get into the cycle, it's pretty hard to get out, right? In high school, I did have a couple friends. Um, mm -hmm. That was nice to have. In college, uh, I made friends really, really easy. Oh, no. I yeah. just, just was just great at it. It's just uh, been the momentum from high school. Never from high school, college. Then it was the thing ever. Yeah. And then did you go to college to do uh, comp sci as well? Or? Yeah, I did. I went to college to do comp sci. So awesome. my time in college was a vastly different thing. Made a lot of friends. All that. So it's just and, a different and, one. Yeah, look, I, I, and we were chatting the other day when we met in person for the Brazil Mansion event, which was a, a tremendous success, by the way, uh, in which, there, there you go. Uh, Thurso is always, a, you know, for those uh, uh, who follow the podcast that uh, don't really know too much about us uh, professionally, like I am the CEO of Thurso, uh, and, you know, just we did, just did this uh, event for 500 people in Brazil uh, with the Primogen. Uh, obviously, you got a lot of love from, from there. And we were chatting... This was super cool, man. And we were chatting a little bit about like uh, about religion, and obviously today, you are, you are you you see this very differently. Like, so what do you believe today, uh, as specifically as you can? Because you know, Christian sometimes is just not uh, specific enough. Uh, you believe in the moth. <laughs> it's yeah, the moth. Now. The moth will not uh, let me <laughs> leave me alone. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could probably just put me under the generic Christian category, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, just like fairly historically accurate mm -hmm. Jesus style would probably be the, the best way. Um, yeah, well, I, I'm not sure how well, to sum it up other than that, because there's so much yeah. nomenclature and all that. Just like mm -hmm. you're saying, like, I don't I don't like 
Oh my gosh, the thing almost hit me in the face. Uh, the the like the thing I like I I'm not oh 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 man. Uh, the thing I don't I have like, I have a zapper. I have a zapper. Sometimes, I know I need to get a zapper. Fun. Yeah, I know, but then I get distracted and I'm just zapping all day. Uh, yeah. But like like I like I I'm not into all of the uh, Lutheran stuff. Like I'm not sure if I I believe in the literal uh, trans whatever they call the trans blah 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 of blood and body and all that kind of stuff in mm -hmm. in the com in communion and all that. Like as far as specific goes, there's like a kajillion specifics that I just don't. I I guess I don't really think much about because mm -hmm. I just don't find them that like that useful. I guess if you will, they don't have really any meaning yeah. in my life. I'm not sure if they really have that much meaning for a lot of people. No, I, it, it certainly like, uh, but how, how, how did that come to be? So, you know, if you are this nihilist person, uh, and then, you know, what out of a sudden a couple of years later, you're completely different. What changed? Oh yeah, that's simple. Um, so I yeah. was, uh, so I was doing a lot of, a lot of drugs, all that kind of stuff. I was really yeah. into that whole scene and I just found myself like, when you first start doing that, you at least have some new aspect to your life, right? All things that are new tend to glitter a little bit more than the things that are old. And so there's like a lot of it's very entertaining or exciting, if you will. And so I'm like, oh, this is really, really great. And then as time went on, it just got worse and worse and worse. It just wasn't really fulfilling in any sort of way. And then on top of that, there also was I, I saw porn for the first time when I was four years old. And so I always. Four. Just, yeah, four. And so I had a lot Dude, of. That... A, a lot of problems up. with that. Yeah, yeah. I had a lot of yeah. problems with that. And uh, at just at some point, one evening in my life, I just remember having this really, really intense moment. Uh, you know, like the feeling of someone staring at you. Have you ever, you know, you know, that yeah. that that classic trope of like, oh, it's a ghost in the house. Uh, it, it was mm -hmm. like that, but like a hundred X. And like, I just knew for a fact. And then it was just kind of like, I, I was given a choice in that moment was like, what do you want? And what I really wanted, I, I, me being the ultimate heathenist, what I really wanted was to be happy. Mm -hmm. And so I chose in that moment to go, okay, I guess, I guess I'm following God now. I didn't really know what that meant or anything. And uh, okay. you know how people always talk about these moments where they become a Christian or they change their life around. It's like this magical moment and everything changes and, you know, addictions drop and everything's great. Well, nothing at all changed for me, like at all, like nothing, okay. nothing at all. And uh, the next morning, I wake up. Everything's still the same. Still have the same problem with porn. Still want to use drugs. Still have all the same friends. Still feeling horrible. And I'm just like, oh, that was like a really weird experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I kind of just shrugged it off. Like, maybe, you know, maybe, you know, I, I was just probably stupid is all that was. I was just being ridiculous. Yeah. So then I, you know, I shrug it all off. And, uh, I, you know, I do my lunch and all that. And then at some point, I look at porn and all that. And then all this, you know, and, and, the, and the actions that go along with looking at porn. And then right after that, I felt this horrifying guilt. I've never felt guilt in my lifetime. And all of a sudden, like, that's, that's what I get. That was what changed in me. And so it's just out of nowhere. It's just like, and then when I'd smoke pot, I'd get like deep into this, like, what am I doing with my life? It's like all of a sudden, I felt like I had, a, I had more of a reason to be here than just that. And like these mm -hmm. other things were just like so weak uh, uh, and they're just like, they're just not how I was meant to live. And I just couldn't shake that feeling. And I had just like, I was just not ready for that. And so then it, that was just like a, such a driving force for me for the next four years. Uh, while I struggled with various versions of an addiction from smoking cigarettes, pornography, yeah. drugs, all that. It took a long time before things sh shook out and were normal again. When, when was that? When was that? Because you said this took four years. So when did that start? When 18 that to 22 years? is kind of like when the, or it may, I was think I was 19. I might, yeah, I think okay. I was 19, 19 to 23, right around somewhere right in there. It was just, just a, just a big struggle bus in, in those years for me. And so that's kind of, but I did yeah. gain a skill. I did gain a, a very unique skill in that also. And so people often talk about this idea of natural gifting and for those that aren't in the uh, quote, quote unquote Christian world, the spiritual gifting. And so for me, I had a very natural gifting of, of like being able to hear something, remember it, being able to do kind of complex like logic problems have always been something I'm very, very good at. I've never mm -hmm. felt bad at all about that. I think that's why I just naturally gravitated right towards programming because thinking from A to B just feels exceptionally natural for me. It just is just very, very normal kind of experience. And so I've always suffered from being a bit too logical. Uh, mm -hmm. 
and I've always kind of had these problems where I, I get in fights because I'm just like, that doesn't make any sense. You know, and then then I've learned to chill that out over the years yeah. and not make these logical arguments. And so uh being such a having such that problem, but I also could just I just never studied, I never did anything. And then right after that moment, the other kind of flip to the coin was not only did I kind of have this have guilt for the first time in my life or shame, I'm not really sure which one it was. Uh B, I had uh the ability just to start studying. Okay. And all of a sudden I could just sit down and I could just study. And at first it was like for two hours, which was like immensely more than I've ever been able to. And by the mm -hmm. time I was getting towards being done with college, I could sit down I, for 36 straight hours. I did multiple times where I just would just, just nonstop through the night, everything. It's just like, I, I felt so driven to do things and to accomplish things that it was just much different. Is this experience. something, is this something that you prayed for, for like, Hey, I would like to do no. this for my life. Or is this something that just happened to you? And you, know, well, you were not both at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Both the, sh the shame and the drive happened at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. in a single evening in a moment so like you know that's why i said nothing happened but also everything happened like everything i had no happened, yeah. there was no quote-unquote big awakening there was not a it, the sky did not part nothing nothing happened other than it just was like my my heart raced really far forward but mm -hmm. my head was still in the same place and so then it's just like my whole life and everything looked a certain way but how i felt like was completely Destroyed. I was the biggest hypocrite in the universe at that point. Well, uh, one of one of them because uh, I don't we know. Have, we have strong contenders, man. <laughs> I, the the problem is, is that I don't know yeah. the strong contenders and what they think. Yeah. I knew what I thought, and so I I mm -hmm. personally was the biggest hypocrite I've ever met in the universe. <laughs> you 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 told me once that um, the the problem that you had with porn was even bigger than the problem that you had with drugs and. This resonated, and, and I told you something. I'm happy to share uh, with the public, but you to I told you something in person uh, about that. But like, I, I think that people don't realize how debilitating porn can be. And mm -hmm. it wasn't for me, for for but like it was for you. Yeah. Uh, and it it's this thing that uh, I am radically anti-porn today, uh, and I was not. Uh, and I think. You know, I, I always view this as this, you know, what harm, it, it causes no harm. It's just something that you do on, on your own. And yeah, like, and then there are, the, there are those arguments that people say, yeah, but the people that are producing that for you, like they, they, it causes them harm. Uh, but then you rationalize it by saying, yeah, but you know, s sure, some are like that, but then you just don't watch those, which I doubt you can tell the difference. But uh, and then you also have also, like, well, they're yeah. choosing to do it. They're getting paid. You know, you, you can rationalize yeah, all the, exactly, those ones. I've yeah, heard all yeah. those. Yeah, but but it, it can be debilitating to you as a person, right? So how how is that for you? Because you you, you seem to say that this is something that you struggle to get rid of, but you yeah, wanted to yeah, it was get the hardest of? by far, yeah. the hardest one. Smoking being the the next hardest. Mm -hmm. Um, that was really really hard addiction because it's so much more societally acceptable, right? I found yeah. that the the further you had to stray from society, the easier it is to break the addiction. You're right. You're uh, right. Just pro just proportionally speaking, because it's really easy. And so, yeah, I found that I found porn to be magnitudes harder than anything else. Uh, completely different playing field. Very, very difficult. I, I yeah, I struggle a lot with addiction, and I think one of the reasons it's so hard for me, and one of them I was actually able to overcome. Uh, I think through my belief, my newfound belief in the Lord, uh, I was uh, able to overcome. But many others I was not, and and I think that the reason for that is that my vices were always socially acceptable yeah i never got addicted like for example drinking i can drink and i don't drink too much these days but it's mostly i mean i, I have nothing for it or or against it i just feel yeah. like I, I i'm getting old so i sleep like i, I sleep terribly when, when i drink so i tend wake not up to feeling drink. crappy yeah. you know but well, but um i never I, I the reason i do drink is that i can drink and if i decide i'm not going to drink like uh, i I can say no, so that's not an addiction. It's not an addiction, right? I can say no, and, and I've said no many times, and, and I, you know, but all my other addictions are socially acceptable, uh, are things that most people would not even consider addiction, like working, uh, some video games and, and stuff like that. So you're right, like that stuff, stuff that is socially uh, acceptable, some of them even celebrated as virtues, uh, which after some point they're not, it's harder to, to break. Right? Yeah. No, I mean, but they, they exist in all different formats. You can see people that are, you know, they vicariously live through their kids. Uh, no mm -hmm. one, no one's upset about the, you know, you're kind of upset, but it's not like 
hugely shameful the parents that are way too into say soccer and drive their kids to be great great at soccer uh mm-hmm. or you know all, all of those things academics and all that right you go to the silicon valley and every kid that's six years old is doing multiplication because that's like mm-hmm. what you do you got to be successful if you're not doing math by the time you're four you're not a successful person and all these kind of, you know like and it's very societally expected but really it's like it's super unhealthy behavior it's this like addiction to success that we do mm-hmm. we just we allow because it doesn't at least it doesn't look bad on the outside, mm-hmm. even though you, you meet but, so many kids that are absolutely crushed on the inside. But, you know, especially the kids that maybe they're just they're not gifted at being being good at school when they're young. Mm-hmm. I wasn't gifted at that. I was horrible at it. it. That doesn't mean I wasn't smart or anything. But if I was in that environment, I'm sure I would have been emotionally crushed. I may never have been able to mm-hmm. do anything because I'd have been too crushed by the expectations and the missing of the expectations. In, in which way specifically you think porn was debilitating to you? Uh, I just couldn't say I, I, I could I did I could not exercise uh, liberty or willpower mm-hmm. in it in the sense that it, it was just such a driving force in my life. And yeah. so it's just like, I mean, that's that's it. And and the thing is, is that um, I think it's really like as I got older and as I thought about it more and all those things. The reality is, is that when you are consuming porn or anything, you're you're objectifying the individual, right? Which mm-hmm. means that I am not, um, I'm specifically treating somebody like a means to my ends, and that is a really horrible thing to do. Like people should not be considered a means to an end, and so I really hated that aspect of it. That somebody else's whole existence was only for one specific thing for me, and so I didn't want to be that. Like I didn't want, I you know, I, I had to have some sort of reason. Um, I have to have some sort of um, ground I had to stand on. And unfortunately, my ground I stood on, I did not live up to. And so I just really disliked it. And mm-hmm. and second, I, I wanted a wife at some point and kids. And I had a strong, uh, you know, after that bl- uh, that blessed evening of getting a conscious, uh, I I looked at porn as in some sense cheating on my wife. Mm-hmm. And so even though I didn't have a girlfriend at the time, I still felt horrible because it was like I was betraying somebody else. You know, because if I'm going to get a wife and all that, and which is this is how we've I've lived up to this point. I haven't looked at porn, I think, in 15 years. I have no idea how long. It's been a long time. Um, but like if if I'm going to have a wife, I want her to be the sole and only affection in my life, like the only person that I look at uh, yeah. that way. And I want her to be the driving force because I want her to feel completely and absolutely like safe and protected around me. And so that's kind of the goal of mine, which is to try to love her to the maximum I can love her. That's great. man. And I think one thing that people don't realize, and I don't think you, uh, you know, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But uh, one thing that I realized about porn eventually is that today, if you look around, there is this ethos in society to say that like, whatever you feel is just natural. And you should just, you know, if you're feeling it, you're justified to do it. Uh, because, you know, you don't control it. It's just a feeling that is born yeah. inside you. And the problem with porn is that, you know, it kind of proves that this isn't really true, that your desires are not just natural that emerges within you and you have no control. The more you look into porn, the weirder your desires get. Yeah, uh, there's definitely that, a magnification a, yeah. process through that. Yeah. And lots of those things that sometimes people think, hey, this is just, you know, it's just a, just something that you're feeling. Like you probably would not be feeling that if it were not for the fact that you were looking into other people doing it and and like it's mimetic desire if if you want to get technical and, and quote <laughs> Rene Girard, uh, but you know so I do not think it's true that we are uh, slaves to our emotions that they just come to us uh, and then you have no control over when they come to you it, it might be true they have no control over. Uh, but there are things that you can do to change the things you feel. And one of them is just don't look at those things or right? just uh, stay away from it. And uh, I, I I wasn't addicted to porn. I, I don't think I had an addiction. Uh, and as I said, I, I know what addiction looks like because I, I was and still am addicted to some things. And you hit the nail in the head. It's just you have the sense that you have no liberty, that you, you're not in control, that you cannot say no. Yeah. Um, to, to porn, I could say no to is just that, I don't, you know, at the time, I, the, the funny thing is that I had this impression that I think a lot of people would share. And this is why I think it's important for us to talk about it, because maybe a lot of people in the audience 
feel or think what I used to, to think is that, look, uh, it is impossible for you to live your life without this. Uh, I, may, I may have control uh, at this one moment. I'm not going to do it now. I'm going to do it later. Uh, but uh, in overall, uh, at some point, you're going to do it, right? Just, uh, uh, in fact, I found, it one, I found it ridiculous, like that in the Catholic Church, uh, which I am now a member of, uh, masturbation is uh, something you're supposed to confess. Uh, so I mean, you, 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 you don't do it. It's <laughs> on par to some extent with killing someone. Uh, not on par. They said both of them you're supposed to to go and confess, and I found like that impossible. Because so that, then anybody's going to be confessing this every week because this is something natural that everybody does every week. Uh, and I think inspired by your story, I decided to just hey, I'm not going to do this anymore because this is terrible. This is uh, you know this is this is ob objectifying people. Uh, it doesn't help. It only harms. Uh, and why would I keep doing it? And and then I completely stopped. And it's been it's been not 15 years because I had this realization much sooner. But it's entirely possible for you not to do it, and you don't lose anything. And in fact, you only gain things because again, your 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 desires are more natural. Your understanding of the human person are more grounded in what they are spiritually and physically to some extent. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm on, I'm on that team, generally speaking. Yeah. And there's like a whole host of like studying and things coming out saying actually it is probably super addictive. Yeah, it probably isn't good for you. Yeah, like they had like decision making and men and porno porno or pornographic images and showed that like just even flashing a pornograph uh, pornographic image in front of a man like makes his decision making statistically less reliable for 30 minutes. And there's like all there's all these like extra things that were being layered on on top of mm -hmm. all of it. And I don't know how true or false I, I i'm always a pretty light on the belief of any study just due to the immaculate amount of oh actually they're completely wrong uh that comes out of it <laughs> but i love having confirmation bias where i'm like yeah it's probably right yeah it's probably right because i already That's felt right. like that <laughs> awesome <laughs> no you see so you're definitely not a hypocrite anymore if, if you if you admit that we all have a little bit of confirmation oh i'm super hypocrite yeah yeah oh easy peasy pumpkin yeah. seedsy awesome. i have i am under and no delusion of grandeur which uh, it was a uh, was it Chesterton that said that the, there is nothing more extraordinary than an ordinary man, an ordinary wife, and ordinary kids. Uh, so this idea that you have nothing, you know, nothing big about you, know, nothing of grandeur, uh, I would dispute that. But I appreciate the fact that you think like that. <laughs> but look, uh, you you got rid of this and and you managed to overcome it. Uh, you told me once and like a god played the role in mm -hmm. in you getting rid of that how was that can you can you say that question differently you you told me once that you would not have been able to stop your addiction to porn without the lord's help yeah it was that driving it was just the the driving that that consciousness that driving that, that shame a... thing that happened yeah you know that's that's really i mean that's the that's the turning point of my life was that so it's not very magical, not very sexy. Doesn't make a really great story. It's pretty one dimensional. Yeah, no, it's just it's like great. one day I never felt anything, and I loved I loved acid and sleeping around and then trying to do whatever I can, and then the next day all of a sudden I just felt bad. Never mm -hmm. felt bad in my life. I'm still I'm still like a little upset that I had to just feel super bad. Like that's that what it was. Like wh why could it mm -hmm. just been like everything's just Easier. gone? That would have been. Yeah. I know what the heck was that all about? That's just just mm -hmm. I did not appreciate that. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, you, that, you, you, you just told us all that you are a super logical person, which uh, to everybody that watches your stream, of course, it should be more than obvious. But one, one of the reasons that I wanted to start this podcast is that when I was on the other side, so to speak, so uh, and, and for clarity, like I was an atheist, like really like Richard Dawkins level, uh, I don't believe yeah. in anything and that I'm certain that there's no God. How can I be certain? Because I'm 15. How, I, how would I not be certain? Right. Uh, and but you were an atheist all the way till you're like 38, right? Uh, pretty much. To, but but a lot of that, you know, just uh, that that's a bigger story. But I I started uh, age 14, uh, 14 to 15, and I know the moment. I remember the moment in in which I just said, "Hey, I don't believe in any of this anymore." Then I had a very interesting experience and a set of experiences that led me to question uh, the you know the materialism uh, view of the world. But then I didn't go, go back to religion. I, I, I embarked on like a new age adventure. 
yeah so to speak i think i think it's it was so many things uh, you know for so many reasons that uh, i think that's the best way to describe it and and that lasted until pretty much 30 36 37 so quite recently i'm 41 now so. but i was i was on the other camp and i had a very low impression again very much on the richard dawkins kind of camp i mean how can anybody with two neuron cells believe any of that crap yeah, uh, and you're you're a logical person, and you believe all of that crap. Why why is that? Why don't you, you clearly don't see a contradiction here? No, um, I don't. I mm -hmm. I don't think there's much of a contradiction. I I think it's I think it's um, I kind of think of the world in kind of I guess groups. Like the first thing I think of is just about this, like a desire that we all have for justice. And I know mm -hmm. people will try to they'll try to give you the all shallows is clear, like, oh, well, we're social animals. We grew up in a social circle. And it's like, but that mm -hmm. doesn't hold on like time, time out. T.O. Throw the T.O. here. Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, stop. Like, it's, it's the same thing. You'll hear someone say we know less about our our ocean than we know about space. And it's just like, yo, bro, mm -hmm. there's oceans on other planets. Like, what do you what the hell are you actually saying right now? Like, that's the stupidest yeah. thing I've ever heard my entire lifetime. We know much more about the ocean than we do about space. And so this whole idea that that there exists this desire for us all to see like justice and good, it's just it's just not represented in any life experience. Right. Like everything mm -hmm. you do grinds against that. Every single last mm -hmm. feeling you have grinds against that. And then all of a sudden you like hit these weird walls where you're just like, no, I I want to change this. I actually want to do something that's like anti against my feelings and do something different. Like that's a very bizarre experience. It's, it's, it's anti, it's anti animal, right? You're, an, you're like, you're not mm -hmm. listening to yourself. You're listening to something that's going against everything that you feel in all points. And so that's a very unique or bizarre thing that, you know, I obviously started observing this, but besides for all like the technical arguments about all these things and why you should. And I do think it's equally as stupid to say, if you say there absolutely is no God, it's, it's equally as stupid as saying there absolutely is a God in some sense, like on a purely logical level, because mm -hmm. you're making statements about the universe that are kind of yes. funny. There's easy ways to defeat stuff. Like I never believed in relativism. Uh, I thought, I always thought that was just like the, the most absurd statement of all time, which is there is no truth, which is like an exceptionally absolute statement. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the thing is, is that you can't even say there's multiple truths. Uh, that doesn't work. Logically speaking, you can really only say there is one truth. Like that's the only thing you can say logically speaking and that's the only it's uh, the unfortunate logical conundrum of the universe is that you have to say that there is only one truth there is only absolute truth and there is only one uh everything else is uh is a statement in which cannot exist because even if you say well there is multiple then how, why is that one true why why is that mm -hmm. why is that one point true and you just like well you can't you can't you have to like argue why that it just becomes such a nightmare in actual logical thinking but beyond all those things um there just comes a point where you can't like I I could not fix all my stuff. And no matter how much I hide and uh, and how much I tried and no matter how much I put myself into anything, I never felt anything more. I kept trying to strive for pleasure, if you will. I, if I was going to hell in, in Dante's Inferno land, I would have been in the first, you know, I'd been in rings two through four, right? The mm -hmm. pursuit of 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 just pleasure, right? And it's just like I couldn't figure those things those things out. And it's just because I want, I, I knew that there was more, I could just feel it deep down inside of me. I knew I wanted something more. I just didn't know what that more was. And so that was always been a, just a driving factor mm -hmm. in me. And I've always thought of it. Like it's like a, uh, an echo of Eden, uh, that there, there is this existence in my soul that this world should be perfect and it should be good, but it's not. And I, I, this, this my is perception of desire. Uh, this is one of the arguments that C.S. Lewis would use, that the, the fact that you long for it itself is an argument. I'm very careful with the usage of the word proof. Yeah. So I'm not going to use it now. Uh, but I think that the argument that he, he uses is that that desire in itself is a pointer, is a indication to the existence of God. Because like a, you, you, you cannot be hungry if there is no food. You're only hungry because there is food. Right. If, if food did not exist, you would not feel the need to consume food. Uh, you mean so the, the, desire... the other way around? If you had no faculties to consume food, you'd have no desire to, to eat food. Well, either no faculties to consume food. The, the food, food is just a, used to be a chicken, right? So chickens clearly exist yeah. or cows, etc. So they become food the moment you consume them. 
uh, right? And, and but you, you long for it. If you don't consume it, uh, you long for it. You desire your body, your whole body misses it and, and, and claims for it, uh, clamors for it. Uh, but and but you know just so the fact that you're feeling if you wake up today, I mean I think this is the core of the argument. If you wake up today, tabula rasa, blank slate, you know nothing about the universe. Uh, you you never had food uh, ever because you you know you just woke up from this coma, or, uh, but you start feeling hunger, even though you haven't seen food in front of you. Uh, the hunger itself is an indication that food exists. Because why would you yeah. be longing for it otherwise, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's something inside of you that's pushing you, and that you know you can say argue that as purely biological, and therefore everything we're saying is just like a purely purely biological thing. Um, I'm not really mm -hmm. into that whole concept, uh, generally speaking, uh, just because I, I recognize this when I was pretty young. Because when I whenever I'd get hurt, um, I'd get really sad, and whenever I got really sad, like I just hurt, and I noticed that like. I, I could tell right away that there's there's something more to life than just simply just physical physical driving. Like how I feel in in uh, or influences like my physical experience by a huge amount. And so there's this like, kind of this weird driving, interesting problem that I was dealing with that I couldn't figure out. But being the devil's advocate and like a, what people like me would have said uh, back then is essentially, hey, look, but your feelings are also biological to some extent because they're products of your brain. And right. So yet, of course, those things interact. It is just hardware and software and, and yada, 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 but it all running on your biological computer. So there, it's all there is. Uh, how, how do you view that? Uh, I, I usually view that as just like a, a fairly uh, hubris take in the sense that mm -hmm. um, you think you have the universe figured out. All we just, we just, 15, we just, uh, we, we, we have none of it figured out. Yeah. I mean, the fact that I can get a blood transfusion and have an, and acquire the new desire to eat mushrooms is a very unique world. Well, our, our ability to understand the world is vastly smaller than what we actually have. And like we have, we, we, we truly don't understand how things work. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just am not under this idea that, oh, it's just your driving function. It's just like, you know, I, I understand the, the the shallow claim of that, and it makes perfect mm -hmm. sense on paper. Because even uh, the example that you gave, I mean, the fact that you get a blood transfusion, which is a physical thing yeah. that gets inserted in your bloodstream, and that changes desires that you have, would indicate that those desires are physical. It, it has some indication into that, yeah. but it also has it also has just something else, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, as as uh, as God once said, the the life is in the blood. Mm -hmm. And there's something weird about that whole experience that we are more than just simply a physical matter is how I look at it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I, I'm not quite sure that I, I don't, I just simply don't know. And I don't try to pretend like I know. I just don't, I just have this inkling that the world is not simply materialist. And I'm not, I'm mm -hmm. not like really great with words. Uh, and I don't try to be really great with these arguments because I just don't, I don't think you can ever defeat, like you never convince somebody that, God does or does not exist by arguing over whether or not emotions come from the physical world or if there's something more to it. I, I just don't think you're going to ever win that argument because I, I, I just don't you, think you, it, you really you, you really think so. I, I actually disagree with that. I disagree yeah. with that based on my own experience. And, and I actually I just think that people are not patient enough. I think uh, that I think I, I I'm pretty sure if you, you reviewed your emotions. You don't, you, you, you don't convince them at that moment. So you, you have you have the argument. And then the person remains unconvinced. But the reason I think it's important to have the argument, and otherwise I wouldn't be here, to be quite honest, I mean, do, doing this podcast, but you have this argument. And at that moment, it doesn't convince you. But later on, it does. And maybe you wouldn't have arrived where you did if it wasn't for the fact that you had that argument to begin with. Yeah, I mean, you could be right. People get convinced for yeah. different reasons. And I, 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 I can't speak to all of them, but I just, I, I find it a fairly uncompelling argument in the sense that okay sure all my emotions come from the physical world what does that change does that why mm -hmm. why why do i experience these these things then who put that in motion mm -hmm. right like you can't answer any real life's questions of why am i here who put things in motion why are they in motion why why do i care why do i yearn for something that's perfect why would i ever even think about something that's perfect why do i ever even think why do i think if i was just a basic uh, amalgamation of cells uh, that gained memory in all this. And during my scared infancy of humanity, we looked at the dark forest and saw lightning and large creatures that are going to eat you. 
And not only did we attribute that to a God, we then attributed it to a good God. Like that is just like such an outstanding intellectual leap that it just feels virtually impossible for me to believe that anyone could logically argue that because it doesn't make any sense. It, it makes zero sense. It's a very anti-logical jump because mm -hmm. you should not attribute horrible, bad things to a, a supremely good source. Like it just, that, no one does yeah. that. No one does in that fact, at any point. It, it, yeah. It's fact, a very large argument. Still the reason, still the reason a lot of people leave religion, right? Because they have a, a yeah. logical problem. If the so-called problem of evil, I was talking to Lane about that the other day, right? Yeah. The problem of evil. It's a, it's a classic. It's a conundrum. Yeah. It's actually uh, the thing that very, drove me more illogical. towards re yeah. It drove me towards believing as opposed to driving me away. Because I just Why saw, just because I saw like how, like the decisions I was made, like everything that I was doing was really this great service to myself and at great expense to other people. Great expense at mm -hmm. my observation of other people. That I was willing to even destroy myself just to make myself feel better. Like everything was very anti-life. Mm-hmm. Look, I was telling Lane about it the other day, but uh, at the late stages of my mental change, so to speak, uh, I came to this realization that the problem of evil was also something that was getting me closer to the existence of God and not further. And the reason, the reason for that is that, again, coming from this atheist background, I didn't believe in anything supernatural. Any, anything had to have a physical explanation. And the funny thing about that is that sometimes you don't know what the explanation is. And then you just say, yeah, but, but there is one. I'm sure there is one. How am I sure? I'm sure because yeah. I am. It's the uh, science we'll, of the gaps. Yeah. It's equally yeah, we'll, it's equally as conundrum as God of the yeah, gaps. Exactly. And we'll figure it out. Well, one day, we, we're not there yet. We yeah. don't know, but we'll figure it out. How do I know that? I know because of, I, I, I believe at the end of the day, the day right? But uh, I... So in this, in this worldview in which nothing supernatural can possibly exist... Uh, I, I came to realize that I could explain the good things in the world to evolution. Like we evolved in this, uh, you know, we, we evolved in this environment. So we, we evolved to seek those things. So we see them as good uh, and, and, and et cetera. So the fact that the world is good sometimes for me did not have any logical problems. It's just a sure. I mean, I, I can see how, the, you know, how evolution took us there. But I just couldn't fathom the amount of evil in the world. That it sound it didn't sound random. I mean, it sounded to me like yeah, they're, they're, someone is doing this to us, right? In 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 some sense, um, and obviously that isn't God. Uh, it, you know, if you if you believe in the Christian worldview, that's the other guy. Uh, but uh, at least it you know it helped me broke out of this fully physical uh, way of seeing the world. Yeah. Well, I think the hard part is if we do view the world as fully physical, this is where things all break down. This is like where like the classic person that's like the world is only physical. It, it, the pure materialist or reductionist or whatever one you want to uh, insert here uh, point of view is that then by the very logic, you also have to celebrate Coney, the child soldier Lord, because he mm -hmm. is most certainly taking advantage of all evolutionary processes all the physical world to be able to get everything like, you know, like it is the pinnacle of the purely physical manifestation. Mm -hmm. And that's that. I mean, that is the reality is that if you just think we're driven by bio, uh, biological processes, if you think everything is just a reduction from some social aspect that we've learned, then someone killing someone for somebody else's goods is not a bad thing. It's just not, mm -hmm. but it is, Yeah, you know, it, it, is, it can be, it it's can not, be against, it's not a bad uh, thing. Can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like it, you it, have it to. It can be relatively bad, right? You, you can say it's relatively bad. I mean, for the society, person getting killed, it's bad. <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> no, but but you can you can make the argument. You can make the argument that look, uh, we have societal rules, and within society, we we shun those things, and we don't want those things to happen because, and that provides you an advantage. But you cannot say that this is absolutely bad, right? Yeah, just you can a, just say it's bad for yeah. quote unquote society. But then there's been so, plenty yeah, of societies exactly. that have operated yeah. purely a lot different than we have. And mm -hmm. they have allowed a lot more violence between people. And they still were large societies, very, very large societies and very and su successful su societies. Successful, exactly. Yeah. yeah, the Assyrians were not known for being kind and gentle. Yeah. They were brutal. And, and so, and there, I, there you go. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, well, maybe you can be <laughs> successful in many kinds of societies. So why did we I always imagine one being the good yeah. one? I always imagine uh, people welcoming Genghis Khan for protest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
right? And it's just a completely different, completely different. And he worked for them, you know, and in, in, in that society, in that society, uh, you know, the, the, everybody's humans, we all sh share uh, things that are biological. Again, this is not to say that nothing is biological. Some things are biological and some of those drives at least go through our biology. But Genghis Khan probably had a very different view of the world than, than we do, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, at one point, uh, either it was his wife or one of his many concubines came in and to just test as many as just like shoot her. And so they turned and they shot her dead full of arrows. And like that was just mm -hmm. perfectly fine. That was just how life mm -hmm. works. If you've watched uh, the, the latest Dune, uh, that kind I of did, brutality yeah. reminds me of a uh, uh, Fade Ralpha, right? He would just mm -hmm. like just destroy everything, kill people around him. He celebrated in in death, right? Like that's that's there's there's people like that. And, and the hard part, again, when it comes down to purely materialist arguing is that it's extremely hard to actually make a case for why that's wrong but we all 100% know it's wrong. Yeah. And I, and I'm just not buying the buy. I'm just not buying the evolutionary thing. Cause it just doesn't make any sense. Cause it appears nowhere else. It doesn't even come None close those, to appearing. Yeah. It barely even appears in ourselves. It's an active fight. You have to put up to not do those things. I mean, that's yeah. why, you know, people always make fun of, uh, you see all these really dumb, really, really dumb things on the internet saying like an eye for an eye makes the whole world mm -hmm. blind. And it's just like, Hey, you only say that because you live in that modern world. Yes. You don't know no, what the past. World, right? Yeah, you don't know what the past world was like. The past world was, oh, you hit my wife. I'm going to go murder you and your entire family. Right. You've dishonored me like everybody dies. And then, you know, the law comes down and says, OK, hold on. If they knock out one of your eyes, you can knock out one of their eyes. You cannot exceed that bounds. Also, that puts like a huge funnel on a reduction of violence and just intensity and all the things that go wrong. And it's because they don't have a, you know, there is no perception of a world that that could exist, but that world was the normal world for a long time of just like, just mm -hmm. utter brutality. Look, now no, we don't none of that. those arguments. Yeah. N none of those are, none of those logical arguments for whether or not there is a God ever convinced me uh, at all. Uh, today, today I accept it, but I had to accept something else first. But that, you know, they they seem to convince you from from the start. But what some people would say is that, fine, uh, okay, I accept this argument. Like uh, one one of the arguments that a lot of people tend to accept is the prime mover. Like, okay, sure, there is a prime mover, so there is yeah. you know some de deistic Spinoza kind of god that put the universe in motion. But how do you go from that? In, in, in your experience and in your life to hold on. It, not only there is a God, but as it so happened, he uh, 2000 years ago, give or take, uh, he came to earth on the flesh. His name was Jesus, uh, later called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he died for us. Uh, and you believe that. And how do, how do you go from one to the other? Uh, for me, mine was, mine was more experiential. Right. Yeah. I never had shame. I never had any sort of interaction. Right. So if, if, if there was a God and I had direct interaction, then that would have changed my perception of it all. So until mm -hmm. that moment happened, it was just like man in the, you know, man in the clouds. Right. I had a very Looney Tunes yeah. grasp of what, oh, sure. Yeah. There's a cloud somewhere with an angel. And so for me, it, it nothing <laughs> changed until that, you know, until that moment. And so for me, it's kind of like the inverse, which is that I now had a very direct experience. Why? Why, why did my heart get so violently changed? And the worst part of all changed very, very much against what I want. Mm -hmm. Cause I did not but, but want But how do it. you know, how, how do you know that, you know, this was not someone else? That I had a, 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 just those couple of experiences, right? Because at yeah. that point I was just like, is this actually real? Am I just making this up? Is this some yeah. sort of, you know, set of things? Um, at one point, I finally uh, was just like, that's it. You know, like, I just don't know if the, I think I've deluded myself. And there's absolutely no way this is real. Just it's just not I've 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 convinced myself of something that does not exist. Right. Because, you know, mm -hmm. again, the logic is always it's the hard be. part, which is. Yeah. yeah. And so I was like, I've convinced myself and I was in a very unusual place, a place I normally am never at. I was in a room, you know, I was far away from any last person and all that. And then right when I thought that, I still remember that there's this man named Austin. He just walks in. He's just like, hey, 
I had this really strong feeling like God was telling me I'm supposed to come and talk to you. Like right then and at that moment, I was just like, dang, I'm even getting checkmated in my checkmating, right? Like I just couldn't <laughs> escape from this. And this happened more than once where I was just like, dang it. Why is this happening? This is so stupid, right? Because like I didn't want it to be real. Mm -hmm. I had no desire for it, if, if you will. I, I had supreme desire for it in the sense that I wanted to live a life that actually was good. But I did not want to live a life that I was responsible for any of my actions, if you will. But I, I don't get it, like uh, how, how any of that brings you closer to the Christian God specifically. Is it really just because you grew up in, in that culture or? Oh, because I, I specifically, well, that's because I prayed and asked for him. I said, okay. show me, prove, you know, mm -hmm. that doesn't always work, right? I, I would not yeah. recommend the prove it approach. Uh, but for whatever mm -hmm. reason, I got proved. Uh, I got served. And so that's the, the strong solidifier. Obviously, I started there. But then I took classes and started thinking about other religious type stuff. And I just tried to understand it all. And I kind of came to the, the same conclusion, which is all world religions are the same. Except one. Except one. Except one. Everything is Remember, always, yeah. everything is you reach for it. Meaning like, you got to do all these things. And then you cross some sort of line. And then it is good. But if you don't reach for all those things, then it is bad. Whereas on the other side, on, on the Christian side is it is bad. And if you say, I can't do it, then you win, <laughs> which is just like, it's like the polar opposite of all other ones. And I was like, this is exceptionally unusual. The, 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 the perfect mirror that they are of each other, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're not, they're not the same. They're like, they're like perfectly inverted of each other. And there's only one on the perfect inversion side, which just seems kind of bizarre to me. And so there's yeah, like little that. factoids yeah. along the way that helped you know, solidify these little things. And then, you know, there's, there's, you could do the whole thing with like the manuscripts and the historicity and, and all, you know, the, the, there's like 10,000 other things that also go along with it, but those are all, I find them very boring in the weeds. And when you're questioning things, it's a great read, but if you mm -hmm. just absolutely don't believe it, then it doesn't really matter. Like, I don't think a lot of people are like, Oh, well, actually I was not believing, but then I learned that there was 25,000 manuscripts in five different languages. And I'm like, well, then Jesus must be real. Like, no, I, I'm just not sure if those are like a good, well, it happened a good to me. Place. It happened to me. This is what happened to me. This is pretty much what happened to me. You uh, got hit with the I, manuscript I, count. And you were I just did. like, dang it. <laughs> You're well, telling it, me that funny. the Odyssey had like three, 1400 years yeah. later. And the, you know, then you're just like, yeah, dang it. it. Well, not not to the specifics, but but you know, just and, and in fact, uh, I have a very different uh, experience than I guess a lot of people in that sense, and um, I'm still coming to terms as to why. And the best uh, the best answer I could find so far, which could be right or wrong, I I have no idea. Right, just uh, as as you know, like uh, sometimes we're just winging it. Yeah, is that like maybe maybe you know God wants me to share those experiences to show other people who are very rationally uh, stubborn. <laughs> Uh, as I was, that like, uh, look, if you can, you can get to this through sheer rationality, which, which is again what happened to me. Uh, I I'm not a very experiential person, uh, and and sometimes I pray to God these days, say, hey, uh, I I already accept you, and you know, through rationality, I've done the work, I've done the job, you know, the, of like showing people. Uh, can I have the experience now, please? Because I'm not a very experiential person in general. I don't feel much. I'm like I, I'm hyper rational. Uh, but still, still for me is is very and and going back to your point about convincing stuff. Uh, one of the things that I all I, I shared in in this podcast before, but like just just doing it again. Uh, I I had an experience with a person again, not not an an encounter with a person around twenty fourteen, uh, so, so or around ten years ago, uh, in which. I was having this eight days conversation and this, uh, that was a room with a Catholic person and a North a Christian Orthodox person, Eastern Orthodox. And they were trying to convince me that God is real and I should be a Christian. And I, I told them, uh, look, I, this is all nonsense. Uh, this is not, none of that is provable. Uh, all of that is woo woo. Uh, and, and religions are not falsifiable. It are just claims that you make. Uh, and the thing is that even the claims that you made now, to some extent, are non-falsifiable because you can never say that it was Jesus or it was not Jesus or do you feel this yeah. or you don't feel that. Uh, you know, so different people come through different paths. And to my surprise, this person, the Orthodox one, agreed with me and said, uh, you're right. 
uh, religions are non-falsifiable. It's not something that you can falsify. You will never know. Uh, you know, just it's just people except one. There is one religion that is falsifiable, uh, and that is Christianity. And then I called bollocks. I said that's nonsense. Uh, and what he said is that look, if you read uh, the letter to the Romans, uh, Saint Paul is saying that uh, we're here. Again, I'm, and I'm terrible at quoting things verbatim, but he's saying we're here because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And if that did not happen, we're all wasting our time. Just let's just let we're the biggest yeah. fools in the universe. Uh, so you cannot falsify the claims of the of, of any of those religions. Uh, you can't know that the, this thing really is a religious thing or not. And and you you can't claim you know you can't prove or or even have any evidence that the world had a creator or didn't have a creator. But you can look at history. You can look at history. And understand that this event is falsifiable. Either this man rose from the dead or he didn't. Uh, and the way I came to faith was through understanding, through looking at history. And the reason I looked at history late, because at, at the moment, uh, when he said, if, if Jesus didn't rose from the dead, we're all fools. My response was, yeah, you're all fools. Yeah. Uh, so he, he, did, he didn't convince me at the moment. But later on, like 10 years later, that became a fundamental uh, part of my worldview. Uh, and when I was looking coincidentally at history for other reasons, part of the reason because I love the Roman Empire and, and I was trying to understand how some of those things happen, uh, I understood that, look, just uh, this happened, this thing happened and you can falsify it. You can, you can, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to claim that anybody who looks into it is going to be convinced, but there is plenty of evidence to show uh, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And if he yes. did... Uh, then you know. Then you have to reevaluate a lot of things about what what you think about the world. Yeah, yeah, I've been through those. Those are uh, rather, yeah. they're rather shocking. There's decent. There's a, there's a, at least it, there's a very decent amount of. Um, it's a very it's a it's a it's a it's quite the conundrum once you get into it. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think the most absurd theory, the anti theory, would be the yeah. swoon theory, which still gets trotted out every now and then. That Jesus. What's that? What's God, that? He got stabbed by the Romans, you know, got crucified, all that kind of stuff. And but then when they wrapped him up in cloth and everything, he swooned in that cloth for those three days. And it he actually came back. He didn't actually die. He oh, okay. He was healed enough that he could leave and then say he didn't die. I heard that one. Yeah, I heard yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for okay. me, that's yeah. the that's the least plausible uh uh counter argument. Because that suggests that there's a bunch of people who their term for uh, resurrection, which we use today, literally means upright dead, dead man walking, mm -hmm. right? Like they did not believe mm -hmm. in dead people walking. It was very unusual mm -hmm. for that. Like that was a very anti-Roman, anti-Jewish type thought. And mm -hmm. so when he came back, if he was just like crawling, because remember, he had nails driven through the feet, he would not be walking. Yeah. It would not be looking good. And he was just absolutely just battered and could barely breathe and barely move. And maybe he's not going to make it. I don't think anyone's going to yeah. be like, oh, that's God. <laughs> like, that, yeah. there's just, this is just such a stupid well, argument. And, and, and precisely because the whole argument was like, he came back and commanded respect, right? If, he, if it was just the three days later after crucifixion, even if you survived, you would not be in, in, in any position to command that level of respect, right? You're clearly just beaten up. Yeah, you clearly My somehow favorite, did yeah. not get killed. I mean, that's the reason why they broke uh, the femur was that people mm -hmm. did actually not die from, from crucifixion. And so mm -hmm. typically what they would do is they'd stab you in the chest. And if you made any sort of movement, they would then break your femur to ensure you couldn't run away by accident when nightfall came and somehow night you got mm -hmm. away. Like, because it did happen. Mm -hmm. Like people got away, mm -hmm. but they did not in fact break his femur because they're like, this guy is really dead. Like not kind of mm -hmm. dead. He's like really, really dead. And the Romans, mm -hmm. they were a lot of things. And one of those things was really great at killing people. I mean, they were they were absolutely fantastic at it. We thought we were talking about Genghis Khan. We could have used the Romans as an example, right? And all the things yeah, that they did to Carthage. And uh, it wasn't that Cato that uh, he would end every discourse that he had by saying Carthago de Lenda Est, which means Carthage must be destroyed. Uh, he would he would go on the on this uh, on the in front of the Senate talking about the price of grain, and he would make this speech about why grain should be cheaper and what we should do to oh and by the way Cartago de Lenda S that that's how he would finish, uh, uh, and eventually he got his wish. <laughs> so you're right. I mean they they were truly my my favorite one is the alien one that he, Jesus was just an alien so that's why he had uh, all of those. Ah, alien of the gaps.
Alien. That one. That one also feels really. Uh, yeah, it just feels. Yeah, it's yeah. just. It's such a. It, it's. It's somehow more of a stretch. Like just the the actual no, but that's logical why it's my favorite, conundrum that exists. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because not only were they an alien, that means they would have foreign bacteria on them. And like, just imagine yeah. what it would be like. Because you know, we can reach not too far in American history and Canadian history, and remember the plight that was put upon the Native Americans just mm -hmm. by simply having different bio biology. You, yeah. Yeah, immunities. And so they're like, just imagine what alien immunity and alien bacteria looks like. If an alien walked on this earth, we would all die and they would die probably from us as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or they is, isn't that the of plot of the, that, that, that book from Julius, is it Julius Verne that wrote like the uh, Martian invasion? As I age, I'm getting terribly, I'm getting terrible, like I'm remembering names of things. Yeah. So what is the I've name? What is the name of the book? You know, you, you read the I don't book know that one. The, yeah, no, so, but it sounds fact, very plausible. We'd all die from yeah, just diseases of each other. The the aliens were defeated essentially by bacteria, and and <laughs> that's the, also the reason stupid. the the reason this book was famous because somebody decided to read the book aloud on the radio uh, in the 1930s, and then people thought it was real, and they were reporting an actual invasion. <laughs> so that that became quite famous because of that. But like uh, the, at, in the end, and, and I think if I'm not mistaken, this is Julius Verne, but. Uh, at the end of the book, the aliens die from bacteria. Yeah, I've always hated those because the reality is yeah. like, let's just pretend. I know we're way off topic, but we're going to do it anyways. Yeah. Let's yeah. pretend an alien invasion did happen. The aliens mm -hmm. get here. They fly across. Even if you just go with, uh, what's, the, what's the book called? Um, uh, the three-body problem. They're, they're jumping from mm -hmm. just the nearest star, four light years away. They're able to do light year travel mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if they actually make it here, they'd be so vastly superior in technology they would just simply like press a button or maybe they, they had touch screens at that point they'd wave their hand yeah. and then we would just all fall dead on the on the planet like it just mm -hmm. it just Pretty wouldn't much. even be it just wouldn't even be a thing we just all be like ah yeah. we died <laughs> yeah dang no, we're but, dead <laughs> look uh i the thing I, I eventually realized something inside me had to change because if i think if i had looked it's not just the the manuscripts right but if i had looked at all of those things, which uh, when I when I decided to study it again, which w was around the time I, I came out of atheism, seventy percent of the things I saw, I knew them before. I just saw them with a new light, because I, yeah. I had I think a, a different. I won't call it a bias, but you know some some things have changed uh, in in the way I saw the world, and it, it's funny to understand what are those things and 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 why. But the other thirty percent was brand new. Right. And, and things I had no idea about. But even the things I knew about, I could always find an explanation. I could always find an explanation, a, a rational explanation for this thing having having happened. What it became increasingly hard for me to do was to find an explanation for the collection of those things happening. Right. So just that when, when you put all of those, those those things about Jesus together. Right. Because, look, yeah, uh, for example, like I just uh, you you so he he was an, an alien or whatever that, that does not explain the stuff that happened later <laughs> which is yeah the, it, it, exp, it explained this but it does not explain the, the stuff that happened later so you can find convincing arguments for you know convincing counterpoints to each of those arguments but it became to me increasingly hard to find a compelling story that would explain all of them uh except except that this event really happened and and like this this stuff that those people are talking about are is real yeah 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 as i looked into things that's it just it was more of a oh no like it is very the totality of it is very difficult mm -hmm. especially the whole 500 any... people and yeah. Yeah. you know it's very easy to see one person you know it's uh, you always see like a group of people believing in something until one of them dies and then that group quickly falls apart and they don't, you know, I mean, they even like the funny part is that even in uh, what is it, Acts, that they're doing a quotation from one of the Jewish leaders and the Jewish leaders is like, eh, or maybe this was in uh, not Acts, but they're like, ah, if we just kill Jesus, then just like all the other, just like all the other people that have ro rose up to claim to be something, once they die, their following effectively falls apart. It'll be easy. Mm -hmm. like, that's how we will know, is what they said. And then they you know, mm -hmm. then, then, then they successfully carried out their mission and then it did the opposite. <laughs> I do like that part. That's always just kind of like fun. 
a fun is, irony is to there, life. Yeah. Is there any one of those arguments that you you like the most, and you think like, hey, this, you know, this is this is really good. I mean, this is if if I could choose like the one thing to talk about that to to prove that this event really happened, that would be the one. I, the dying thing. I I, th I yeah. just find it uh, largely uh, implausible for twelve people to have seen some dude get killed, mm -hmm. and then for them to continue on, even and say they're in their misery and upsetness that uh, that he died and he wasn't supposed to die, and then they go on and they go, no, he's really alive, right? They convince themselves they have delusions, right? And then one of them dies, and then they, you know, there's still eleven of them, or at that point, I guess there technically be only ten of them, and then they still keep on going. And then another one dies and then they keep on going and then another one dies and then they keep on going and then another one dies and then they keep on going saying, no, it's actually real. Trust us, bro. Like it just, it becomes so implausible from just a human argument that yeah. that just, they, does... they didn't die. They didn't die from the flu. They didn't die from the flu. One of them got, yeah. I mean, the last one, the one that didn't die got boiled yeah. alive. And then when they, when the Romans could not boil him to death, which is a very, can we just all just imagine how horrific like that experience had to be to be boiled long enough that even the Romans were so freaked out that they just exiled you. Mm -hmm. Like that's a, that's a bizarre, that's just in the story itself is just bizarre. And these are obviously, these are not just documented in one place. They're actually documented in several places, which yeah. is wild. The boiling of a man who would not die. Uh, I still believe that a lot of the things like what, what I came to believe because, you know, people will point out, uh, inconsistencies in the testimonies and, and etc. And, you know, obviously, like those are people telling the story and, and some people may exaggerate some things and some people were had a different perspective and some people saw things differently and etc. Um, I there is one thing that really threw me off guard when I found out. And so I mean, I was expecting part of the testimony to be not true. In the same way that if you read something in the newspapers today, uh, something some parts are not true. No, just, just because people, you know, people understand things differently and they see things differently and and, and all of that. The one thing I actually thought, okay, you know, uh, the the core of the story is true. So they're just reporting and they're exaggerating. But the, you know, this guy died, came back from the dead. But like this thing with the sun being blocked, no way, no way this happened. Uh, you know, because this is completely out there. I think people just uh, embellish the story, mm -hmm. and I was I was very surprised. And you know, this is one one of the things that told, that threw me completely off guard. I was very surprised to find out that this is actually documented. Yeah, it's documented by two separate writers of the Roman yes. Age. Two, yeah, and, two different and, writers and, and two different publications, if you will. The, the Thalos and and uh, the name of the other guy was uh, was actually reading about this. Uh, what was his name? Flagon. So Flagon and Thalus were just, were two historians, and the thing about some one of the things that people don't realize sometimes is that one percent is estimated that one percent of ancient literature uh, survived, just because you know it's very hard to uh, keep those things alive. So we actually don't have the works uh, of those two guys, like uh, the manuscripts of them describing this do not exist. We know about them from books that survived from Christian sources, uh, but the author is not, what, you, know, so it's, you know, it's essentially like I'm quoting this guy and I'm saying person X in book Y said this, and, and this is how we know that book X, book Y, person X existed. But the thing, the thing is, uh, is that he, uh, this was uh, Julius Africanus, a Christian, uh, uh, a Christian, I don't know what exactly he was, but if a historian, monk, priest, or, or something like that, he is writing to contest what those guys said. So he's writing in denial, which is how you know, like, a, it's, not, it's not that he's saying, you see, like, those, those guys wrote that this is proof that this actually existed, because that would be very biased. He's actually saying, yeah, this thing that those guys wrote is nonsense. So he's contrarian to those guys, because they attributed that to physical explanations. So he's not using that as supporting his evidence, he's using that to uh, say, you know, they they described that and they said it was a solar eclipse, but it could not have been a solar eclipse for reasons A, B, C. And then he starts listing the reasons why this could not have been a solar eclipse. Right. And and yeah. so like uh, this was mind blowing because like any historian for any other thing uh, would say, OK, this is 
uh, evidence that this event really happened because you had this other source quoting the original source uh, in a negative way, right? They, they co cover in a negative way. And you can still learn from this that as unbelievable as it seemed, the, 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 the sun went away. And it was not a solar eclipse because we had a solar eclipse the other day in, in North America. That, that stuff lasts two minutes. Uh, yeah. And this lasted three hours, documented. Yeah, yeah, there's multiple people that write about the craziness and the earth shaking and various other type of writings that existed. It's, it's pretty wild to read about those things. Yeah, we have a comment here from X to add and saying miracles are real. I have absolutely no doubt. And Dev is late again. Uh, language Dev. Yeah, shit. Why would you say that? Yeah. <laughs> You've already dropped a few f bombs on this podcast yeah. as it is. So, I try to avoid it, but and sometimes they're just natural. They're just natural. They're just naturally occurring. They're yeah. they're free form. They're free form yeah. apps. Dalton said earlier as well that the the eye eye for an eye the thing they were talking about happened not much time ago actually even maybe two or three generations. Uh, I will yeah. go further than that. It still happens today. I mean, it's still the default mode of. Uh, I think of human. But yeah, there's plenty of countries that don't that don't operate under a more uh, overarching civil authority. I mean, I, I think the core of this is that within us, we still have this desire. Your first response is the eye for an eye. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, you can you can most certainly see. Um, you can most certainly see it in your own heart in the sense that uh, you can see it at least displayed in manifold outpourings out on the internet, on Twitter, people will just absolutely just shred each other on the internet. I mean, that's really, that's, that's, that's really what people are. And I fully believe that that's like the true humanity coming out. That's not because we are all nice and buttoned up and everything is nice and good because we have all these consequences and all that. But if these rules were laxed, this is what would happen in real life. Do you think Twitter is more like Jesus Christ or more like Genghis Khan? <laughs> I, mean, I don't think that's a hard question to answer. It's more like <laughs> Genghis. Uh, just because, I mean, the thing <laughs> is, is that they, they, there would be a, a significantly larger amount of violence if, if there was just less rules, right? Like that's all it would take. One of the things that I, uh, first of all, want to make something clear for my audience. We have 3,000 people watching us live right now. Uh, again, I, this comes from multiple sources. I don't know if they're concurrent viewers, probably not because Elon does like not on Twitter. Uh, yeah, not on yeah. Twitter. I don't know. I don't know what that yeah. number means. Yeah, but uh, it, it, not concurrent viewers, but it is the, the best uh, number we've seen so far. And I do want to clarify for the honest, anybody who is listening, that I I would love to have people over to t that, that follow other religions. I, I think there is a, a there is a commonality of the religious experience. There is no is not only Christian. Uh, I am a, I am Catholic more specifically uh, because of the things I've seen and, and because of the you know the conclusions I reached. Uh, but I would love to have people over that disagree with that and disagree respectfully in a non-Twitter way. But one of the yeah, things uh, no Twitter one race. of the things that yeah one one of the things that I also came to conclude was that as an atheist we love to attribute the bad things in the world to religion. Uh, so religious wars and religious this and religious that and and this is proof that you know that there is a this is all nonsense, and religion it you know coming from the Richard Dawkins background if there was or even John Lennon if if there was no religion the world imagine a world without religion we would all be living in peace, so a lot a lot of people including myself back then I mean we come from this understanding that you know this is a driving force for evil, because then you get people fighting for those things they're not provable anyway. Uh, Twitter kind of helped me realize that uh, Twitter helped me realize that this is not factual because imagine the the, the the Git versus learn Git versus don't learn Git folks with access to state level weaponry. Yeah, right. You, well, you don't you, you don't fight. you don't actually have to imagine any of these things. I mean, you can just take a brief look around the ninth or the twentieth century, mm -hmm. and there's been plenty of. I mean, China is a great example of a good atheistic regime. Like, what does it look like with atheism? I mean, they, they only wiped out, what, 100 million people? Mm -hmm. 
you know, Mao, Mao just absolutely plowed people down. Like it was nobody's business in the eighties. They used to lift up Mm -hmm. anyone of the religious faith on cranes and drop them until they died in a very public way to help remind people that they're very anti against all that. Imagine tailwind haters with the tank. I is real, real talk. I mean, it it would be bad, but I mean, like you don't, you just absolutely don't need what the, what the real takeaway is, is that, I mean, it's the same thing with like, you know, there's, there's a sexual infidelity in, in the Catholic church. There has been molestations of children that are absolutely horrible. And we can all agree. And we all look at that. And there's a reason why that hurts a lot is because the expectation of them is much, much higher. But there was a study Mm -hmm. again, studies, uh, you know, take it lightly, a data analysis that showed that kids were sexually abused at a hundred X rate in public school with teachers comparatively to the Catholic church. But nobody's upset about that. I think the, the general perception is that if you claim to be of a religion of peace and you do not act peaceful, then it's somehow just extraordinarily worse than it is if you don't claim those things and you misbehave. Somehow you do not fall under the same hate guys as the other way around. And I actually agree with it because you aren't living – because you've made an absolute claim like there is a moral reasoning and then you fail – Mm-hmm. on this moral reasoning it's somehow much worse than if you say i don't think there's any reason to do something and i think i can do whatever i want and this is why richard stallman still walks around despite the fact that he said horrible horrible things on the internet including that it's okay for young kids to have sex with adults right? like that's 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 absolutely at- atrocious yet there's a man out there that's that's a part of that right it's because mm-hmm. he does not make the same moral claims i think and that somehow flies under the radar much less than say the catholic church and so that's oh, that's how I look Richard, at the world. Richard, is that it all exists? Stallman, Everyone is yeah. evil. Yeah, Richard Stallman makes a lot of moral claims, and, and the, the thing is that he would include he would include that in in his moral guidance. But uh, yeah, uh, his whole um, his whole worldview was is informed by like this is the moral thing to do. Like the whole idea of free software, the beef that he always had with the people claiming the term open source is that open source is not a moral claim. It is a practical claim, and we have to approach this from a moral perspective, right? That closing the source is wrong, but somehow in his moral worldview, there is space for for that. So, you know. yeah, but I mean, to, to make that drive the point home is that even in institutions in which people claim a bunch of these things, even where we have the mm-hmm. Saint uh, Augustine's. Uh, uh, rules of engagement where like you cannot do mm-hmm. more harm than harm is done. Like there's like all these type of rules that you can go through and go through everything that he's claimed that uh, we should behave as they're still great evil. Mm-hmm. And to me, that doesn't somehow make it that if there was no religion, there would be no problems. What that says to me mm-hmm. is that people can't live up to being good. Like that's just not a fundamentally achievable position among humans. Now, there may be somebody that, given the fact that they've never really been challenged, they can view themselves as pretty good because they've never really had a moral bar to live up to. Sure, fine. I'm not going to argue against you. But put yourself up against a moral bar. Yeah. You know, here's a great example. Say no to that extra cookie. Just watch anybody fail at that one. Oh, I, I, I like it. My, my addiction that I mentioned that I cannot get rid of is food. Yeah, uh, watch them just take some yep. very trivial addiction and be like, all right, just say no to it just for a second. Be, be the good person. Say you can do it. Just watch uh, people. I've I've just heard flounder. I've heard uh, I've heard the other day this explained in such a beautiful way, which is you're all beating on Tiger Woods because uh, you know he cheated on his infidelity, but you're saying this from your living room. You're not saying this with a hundred Swedish top models uh, throwing themselves at your arms, right? So that's easy. Yeah. Uh, what would you do? What would you do? Like uh, it's easy. Or as my favorite philosopher, Mike Tyson, always says, I mean, everybody's got a plan until you punch in the face. So when you're faced with uh, when you're faced with with the temptation, yeah. things are very, very different. And everyone, everyone has the moral high ground until you are faced with a real conundrum and you actually really get to measure yourself. And that's why I think, uh, you know, again, that's why I'm not above any sort of mor- moral failure. That's why I don't, mm-hmm. I, you know, you never hear me calling out, being upset at people for these kind of things because I realize just like how easy it is to fall into these uh, things. Uh, I don't, you know, like obviously if you do something egregious, I think you should, You there's various things you should lose, but I'm not going to completely dunk on you because I realize just how simple it is even for me to fall into these kind of problems. But it's just like, I just don't have those pressures right now. So I'm happy I don't look at porn because what happened if I had those pressures all of a sudden? 
you know, would I be up? Would I be up for the fight not to cheat on my wife in, in a physical way? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, I'm not trained mind, bo mind, body and soul, but now I am, I'm, I'm training for it. So when that day comes, I can be like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, I, I was extremely addicted. I was extremely addicted to a game. Uh, and, and the thing about me is that I'm not a very eclectic person. Uh, I, 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 I was never the kind of like playing video games in general. So I always ever, I mean, I, as a kid, as a teenager, I played a bunch of stuff, but I only ever played one game, like seriously, that was Civilization. Yeah. Uh, but I started playing this, this game at age 17, Civilization 2, and I played pretty much all of them, uh, except for a period of time when I was in university, but I just didn't have the time. And I was playing Civilization 6 the other day, uh, and unlike other things, uh, and my wife's now saying that I got addicted to chess because I've been playing a lot of chess, but I, I, I know the difference. Because like I play, I am obsessed with chess recently because I keep playing and I want to play and then I get frustrated because I lose. But if I had to stop, I do. And with civilization, if I had to stop, I didn't. Uh, that that is the like my best chance was not starting a game because once I did, I just could not stop. I could not by the life of me stop. And this is this is addiction. And, and I only, like, there was this one day that, like, my, my boy wanted, he was two, uh, and he wanted me to give him a bath, and I was playing the damn game, and he came down crying because I didn't go up to give him a bath, a two and a half or something like that, and I felt terrible because I wanted to be with my kid, and I want to be a good dad, and I want to give him a bath, but I did not stop playing because I couldn't. I, right just so, so that's different and I, I had to i don't play anymore but I, but i also don't even start i don't even start because i know uh exactly that yeah. part of part of part of the way in which you fight addiction is that it's really hard and i, and I think only with, with the lord's help i was able to actually stop because not even my kid i mean i did feel terrible but not even my kid being there asking me daddy you know come uh, I, I i could i could stop i, I just didn't uh, but, but, you know, even though I don't start, I, I know that, I know that the day I plan this, I, if, if I ever played this game for five minutes, uh, all the work that I've done in the past three years of not playing gone. Yeah. And it will happen. No, yeah. Will I, there's, I do various, I do, <laughs> yeah, I do, I, mean, I, yeah, yeah. I do same things in the sense that, yeah. uh, I, I avoid all, a lot of stuff, right. Uh, I avoid any sort of, uh, like, you know, even don't like, because people like there, there will be various uh, photos on the internet of, we wouldn't call it pornography, but we'll just say that they're less dressed than they are more dressed. And so I will personally just avoid even glancing at those yep. photos because mm -hmm. I know that there's a demon waiting around the corner. Like I have, yes, you know, the alcoholic shouldn't take a drink just because they mm -hmm. haven't been an alcoholic since they haven't drank in 10 years. Right. I mm -hmm. just know for a fact that like, it's just, it's just right there. So I, I mean, I, I, I understand the idea that I just have to be very protective with my vision. Cause I don't know. I don't know if it's like alcoholism, like will one small thing destroy me? Like it does an alcoholic or will it be, you know, cause I know some people that uh, I knew an alcoholic that couldn't even have like white wine cooked into a white sauce uh, Alfredo. Cause like that alone would trigger it. And so it's just like, there's people that are super sensitive to, you know, relapsing if you will and so i have always been on the it's better to be hypersensitive and lose out on something than it is to be mm -hmm. risking and lose out on something far better uh dev has a better example than the tiger woods thing we talked about look at that so i'm putting the comment here everybody wants serverless until they get to dos yeah that's a fact so that is that's a that's a fact but i do like the tiger woods one. i really do because a lot yeah. of people just simply haven't experienced you know, there's all these people that, you know, there, there's a very popular phrase in or idea in today's society that people look down on people with money and they're like, oh, they're all these like bad people and all this. And it's just like, man, if you had money, do you th you think somehow you'd be a better person? Yeah, I mm -hmm. doubt. I'm like, I'm pressing X hard right now because I do not believe it. Yeah. And and also, like uh, one of the things that I've heard from someone some 10, 15 years, more like 15 years ago that stuck with me was this one guy. Uh, he was very peaceful. He was very, very peaceful. Uh, and was always like the Zen guy, never like uh, mellow and never agitated. But he was a, a 
black belt in martial arts, like a sensei and however many dance he had, like super skilled. Uh, and he practiced uh, yaijutsu uh, with real katanas, which is essentially like a so the Japanese sword, but he practiced with real cutting swords uh, and he practiced the technique to actually cut things and slice things up and etc. But very peaceful guy. And then one day he was asked, why do you do this? And this is a real story. I, I, I knew this guy personally. Uh, and he said, I do this to learn how to kill people. And everybody, everybody was shocked because, you know, this is this guy that is always talking about peace. And then he explained that until you learn how to kill people and until you have the power to kill people, you're not peaceful. You're just weak. Yeah, fair. Like you, you don't have the like, right. You, 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 you don't have the right to tell yourself, I wouldn't cheat on my wife if you're ugly, <laughs> poor, and nobody else is available to you. The same way that you don't have the right to say I'm peaceful if you cannot cause harm to anybody, but if you can, and then you choose not to, that's virtue. Uh, so from from that point of view, I think that that's what he was talking about. Yeah, it's a good one. Actually, I actually like that a yeah. lot. I think at some point I will I'll probably end up regurgitating that story as my own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know a guy that I mean, knows a guy. <laughs> I know a guy that knows a guy, and like uh, you know, just uh, I. I trained I trained martial arts for a while as well, and and he was not my sensei, but uh, I I met him, uh, and even though he did not tell me that story, this I heard this story from one of his students. Like it was completely believable because, you know, that was the guy. Right, he was super peaceful. Yeah. Well, I like you. Awesome, man! It was a pleasure having you today. Uh, I had a blast. I hope uh, I hope you, you too. Uh, Dalton Singh here. Nice point of view. Uh, look, come back anytime. It was a pleasure yeah. talking to you. Sorry that my my story isn't as as thoughtful <gasps> as you might ho ho hope it to be. Uh, I kind of went in a uh, reverse direction and then searched out for information as opposed to search out for information. I had, I had a little Everybody... bit more of on the on the using side of things, on the addiction side of things that. Okay. Was a primary Everybody, driver. Look, I I've heard from a lot of the the viewers that they appreciate how non directed those stories are. Uh, you know, I, I you know we were preparing to turn off, but now I have to tell you that story. All of this idea of a podcast started when I went on your stream, and then the audience started calling me Joe Rogan. And then I figured, look, maybe I should maybe I should have a podcast, and and. Uh, that's why I wanted to be long. Uh, I explicitly am not Joe Rogan, but I wanted to be like long form and have those deep conversations. And my first idea was to have a podcast called The Boomer Angle, where uh, I would bring a bunch of boomers to talk about technology. Uh, and, you know, Boomer Angle, that was the joke. Yeah, I get, I, I get that. Don't worry. But, that's but a very if, boomer if way to, to explain it. But if you have to explain it, it's probably, you know, like, like I did to some people, like uh, it's probably not a great joke. But I also... Figure, you know what, like, uh, I want to have those personal connections and, and, and talk about personal stuff. And, and that's just nicer because nobody else is doing it, right? Just, uh, and that's what Joe Rogan would do. <laughs> <laughs> what would Joe Rogan do? What would Joe Rogan that's what WWJD <laughs> stands for. It's Joe, right? There you go. There you go. Awesome. Brian, thanks for coming, man. Yeah, thanks for time. having me. I appreciate that. Do I stick around?